Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm really excited to welcome you to tonight's conversation with Joe Men and Brian Knappenberger. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to invite you all to come back to the Hammer Museum and see our summer exhibition, which is a retrospective of the British artist Sarah Lucas. And also invite you to come out on July 30th and 31st. We're going to play the Democratic presidential debates in their entirety uh, with a cash bar, and we'll have a panel discussion afterwards about the, how the debates went. Um, in August, we're having a mini film festival celebrating the films of John Singleton, curated by critic Aaron, uh, Ernest Hardy. So we have a lot going on here at the Hammer, and you're all invited to come back. All of our public programs are free, and museum admission is also free. Now on to tonight's conversation. Joe Men is the author of the new bestseller, Cult of the Dead Cow, How the Original Hacking Supergroup Might Just Save the World. The New York Times book review said, the tale of this small but influential group is a hugely important piece of the puzzle for anyone who wants to understand the forces shaping the internet age. Joe is an investigative reporter specializing in technology issues for Reuters, and previously he wrote for the Financial Times and the LA Times. He also wrote the 2010 bestseller, Fatal System Error, The Hunt for the New Crime Lords Who Are Bringing Down the Internet, which is a real life thriller that brought the modern face of cybercrime to a mainstream audience. Fatal System Error revealed collaboration between major governments and organized crime, and was placed on the official reading list of the US Strategic Command. It was named one of the 10 best nonfiction works of the year, and the New Yorker magazine compared it to a Stig Larsson novel. Men's 20, 2003 book, All the Rave, The Rise and Fall of Sean Fanning's Napster, was named one of the best books of the year by investigative reporters and editors, Inc. Men has also presented on hacking and cybercrime at many international security conferences, including RSA, DEF CON, and Black Hat. Brian Knappenberger is an award-winning filmmaker whose most recent film, Nobody Speak, Trials of the Free Press, premiered at the 2017 fin Sundance Film Festival. His previous film, The Internet's Own Boy, The Story of Aaron Schwartz, also premiered at, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and was shortlisted for an Academy Award. His other films include We Are Legion, The Story of the Hacktivists, about Anonymous, the online hacktivist non-group, his award-winning documentary series, Truth and Power, received the Social Justice in Media Award from the ACLU, and he's made numerous other investigative documentaries for PBS, Pivot, Bloomberg Television, The New York Times, National Geographic, and the Disney Channel. So tonight we're going to hear from these two leading experts uh, on the latest and greatest stories from the hacktivist world and all about Joe's new book, Cult of the Dead Cow, and the revelations therein. And afterwards, we'll have a little reception with coffee, tea, and cookies. And we'll have copies of the books for sale. And I'm sure Joe will be happy to sign one for you. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Joe Mann and Brian Knappenberger. Cool. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm um, really thrilled to be talking about this book um, with just this is a this is a great book, um, the Cult of the Dead Cow. How many people have heard of the Cult of the Dead Cow before this book? Um, so we're going to go. We'll, we'll just start at the very beginning. I think. Um, f first of all, congratulations on this book. It's really quite an accomplishment. Um, here's the first line of the book. Uh, technology is deciding the fate of the world, and we're everywhere in its change. We are everywhere in its change. Uh, electronic surveillance, cyber warfare, artificial intelligence, and manipulated social media are on the brink of pushing societies beyond a point of no return. Uh, you started this book three years ago. Was there some series of events in particular that made you want to tackle this now? Well, I guess um, I guess there's a greater sense of urgency. Um, as, as, as time has marched on. Uh, I knew I wanted to do this, this book um, for a while before. Um, let, let me go back and explain why and, and, and what the heck The Call of the Dead Cow is for those of you who, who don't actually know. So The Call of the Dead Cow is, is the oldest um, still running uh, and most influential group of uh, what we would call white hat hackers. Um, um, though some of them, you know, some of them greater than others, but white hack hackers, the, the good guys um, in the country. Um, and uh, um, 
they're, they're a great way to tell the story of good things that are happening in security because they go all the way back and were in the forefront of, of many different things um, before there was the World Wide Web in wide use uh, and still today. Um, but to answer your, your, your initial question, um, I decided I wanted to write about good things because my last book was so depressing. Um, so I'm not that you shouldn't read it, um, but uh, Fatal System Error was had this nice narrative arc um, where some bad guys in Russia who are hackers and extortionists, um, you know, through some amazing detective work um, and international diplomacy, got caught and sent to jail in Russia for eight years, which is something that happens like once every never. Um, and um, uh, but the point of that book, despite the happy part of these guys going to jail, was they were basically were all screwed. Uh, and part of the reason was that Russia is in bed with organized crime. Um, and then the internet architecture is basically indefensible. And you know, software, the laws around so software are such that you can't sue over product liability, even if, if this stuff is like has more holes than Swiss cheese. And on and on and on. There are all these reasons why security is terrible uh, and why this is going to be a, a, a really major problem. So I wrote that. Um, Depressing. Take it. <laughs> it, it like you know, some but sometimes some baddies go to jail, but yeah. it, big picture is terrible. Um, <laughs> and you know, since then there have been lots of other books that yeah. say similar things, like this part's terrible, that part's terrible. We're under surveillance, and that's a lot of them are very good, and that's generally true. But I didn't want to do that again. I wanted to find something that was positive, um, that would um, help sort of shine a light and say, well, here's something we could do to make the world better, and. And once I did that, then the, the CDC was a pretty easy choice. So start at the beginning. What, how did the CDC form? How did the Cult of the Dead Cow form? What are some of those early, the, the beginning stories? And why is it called the Cult of the Dead Cow? Right. So uh, in the beginning, this is 1984, 85, 86, depending um, on who you ask. Um, but 35 years ago, uh, there were bulletin boards. And um, that's how people communicated online generally speaking, and they could be devoted to any topic, could be local events, or it could be uh, Mac software, or it could be, um, you know, uh, it could be politics, and um, people wanted very badly to connect um, and communicate, and you sort of had to want to badly, uh, because it was a pain in the butt, you know, you had this, you know, modem that was powered by hamsters, and um, frequently only one person could connect to a bulletin board at a time, so it was like, you know, you read something, you downloaded a program, whatever, um, and um, hopefully you found people like you. Um, so that was a big driver. So it began in Lubbock, Texas, and the name comes from um, this abandoned slaughterhouse, which was a creepy hangout. And they wanted it to be a little creepy because mostly we're talking about teenage boys here. Um, and, you know, you wanted to have some edge. Even back then, you wanted some kind of edge. You know, it, it's not going to be like the flower patch. You know, it has to be something. Um, or there was the attraction, right? So that's that's how they come. So initially, it was teenage bulletin board operators, um, and then they were writing generally funny, sometimes obscene uh, text files, which was like the they really couldn't do big program type things because they didn't have the bandwidth. Um, so text files was the the best way to communicate. And wh what was what were they talking about? What, what kind of stuff was going on in the, on those boards at the time? Um, so one of one of the first um, ones was a riff on something from the Anarchist Cookbook, and it was a gerbil feed bomb. Um, so you know because they're exploring, you know, it's like an under, you know, it's like a teenage underground newspaper, um, and um, they wanted to like push boundaries and amuse themselves or whatever. So one of one of the things you could find online was uh, recipes for bombs. Um, and so uh, Swamp Rat, um, who I've now outed as, as Kevin Wheeler, the founder of the group, wrote a version of that, but it was funny. It was like, you know, you should pour it, you get a glass jar, you know, pour some gerbil feed in it, dump it out, pour in some gasoline, and then, you know, and then like the rest of it's kind of straight. And it's like, it's pointless and it's sort of funny and it's an inside joke. But a lot of what they did was make fun of the more sophisticated hackers that they actually aspired to be. They didn't really have great technical skills. Like, the guys that did were in groups like Legion of Doom and Masters of Deception, uh, which, um, and but those guys wound up getting arrested. So, um, you know, Cult of the Dead Cow made fun of those guys, secretly looked up to them, 
um, and did some technical stuff just to maintain credibility. But they were like the liberal arts wing of the hacker underground. <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're talking 84, 86 is maybe the beginning of the group. Um, and uh, this is obviously a long time before mainstream internet. So what sort, when you're talking about hacking, what, I mean, maybe you can give a sense of what, you know, phone freaking, that kind of thing. Right. So, yeah, that, this becomes important later. <laughs> uh, the only, you know, um, back in the old days, children, there's this thing called long distance. And uh, it cost a lot of money to connect to a bulletin board, particularly if your modem was being powered by hamsters. And so the only way to connect to a bulletin board that was not in your area code was to have parents that didn't mind you spending $500 on a phone bill every month or um, you could borrow somebody else's credit card um, or credit card. Uh, a, a calling card with a five-digit code or whatever, and you could hack those. You could, you could war dial and you know until you got five digits that worked, or you could get one from a friend. Um, and but once you're connected, some of these boards would tell you, you know, give you other numbers. So basically, everybody who was online in this day, like pretty much everybody, stole long-distance service, uh, which is wrong. Um, but actually, it, it turns out later to be useful because if you are having to make calls like that, you know, whether to break the law and how much to break the law and how to break the law, it turns out you're thinking about important moral choices. Maybe, you know, in retrospect, they were on the wrong side of those, but it, those guys wind up having really good, um, have thought very hard about when, when is a good idea to break law and, and why. Um, and I think that, that actually that's, those people are, really know where, they know where the line is and they know when it's worth crossing it. And I think a lot of the sort of soulless corporate types don't. Um, so I'd rather trust a random hacker really than a random Fortune 500 CEO. Your book is so great in uh, unpacking those early days and this sort of, um, I guess you'd call it, you know, a moral evolution or something. Or w w what do you see in those early days that, that suggests that they're gonna, you know, keep going 35 years? Well. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody thought it was going to last that long. And some of it was just a fluke. Um, um, but, um, you know, I, there was nothing, there was nothing um, hostile in anything they did. Um, and um, it, were, there, it was, you know, actually going back to, like, the early files, you know, one of the ones that strikes me um, was, um, was by a guy named Psychedelic Warlord, or that was his handle. And he uh, he interviewed a neo Nazi, um, and this is this is late eighties, um, and um, basically lets the guy hang himself with his own words. I mean, he he's, he seems like an idiot, um, and um, but I think that was an interesting choice. That like here here's you know a uh, another subgroup. You know, we're kind of a subculture. Here's one that deserves broader exposure because it's a bad thing, and so so. Uh, so you could you could see w where they were going, and I also there's, there's also sort of interesting sort of '60s throwback stuff through a lot of this. Um, so one of the key early figures um, uh, was Jesse Dryden, son of Spencer Dryden of the Jefferson Airplane, uh, which lived with the Grateful Dead in San Francisco, and this begets anti-establishment attitude, but pro-technology attitude because the Dead encouraged tape swapping and all that stuff. So um, the, the phone freakers. Uh, which these guys also were, and who they learned from, also had a major anti-establishment vibe. And it's not coincidence that like AT and T was the enemy, um, because it was, um, you know, there there were reasons to there were pl good solid political reasons to dislike AT and T. And so some hackers felt like better about stealing from them than from from other folks. We can sort of talk about how that evolves a little bit, <clears throat> but first let's talk about psychedelic warlord. Um, the uh, if <laughs> if people don't know this, sorry. I mean, you, you broke a story this year that just like made my jaw drop to the floor when I read it. And you know, this is a crazy year of news, and and it takes a lot to kind of do that at this point. Um, but you revealed the name for the first time in your book, or just before the publication of your book, um, of who that is. Can you want to who? So, uh, psychedelic warlord is better known as Beto O'Rourke, um, and he is running for president of the United States. <laughs> Um, and it still blows my mind um, that uh, somebody who is not only in a hacking group, uh, we never had a hacker, like an admitted hacker run for president, <laughs> let alone like somebody who was in the most influential US hacking group of all time. Um, so it still blows my mind. I've known about this now for like a year and a half or so, and it still blows my mind. Um, uh, 
uh, it's a, it's a, it's an amazing story. Um, but what, one of the things I like about it is that you know normally when you uncover like a politician's hidden past, it's some horrible hypocrisy, right? Like it's like a this made me like him more. Uh, yeah. you know, <laughs> Many people had that reaction. It's like, but it's the same stuff he was talking about then. I mean, he doesn't like Nazis now either. Um, and uh, you know, he's for marijuana legalization, and you know, he's, um, you know, it kind it just fits with his like his earlier campaigns, his Senate campaign style, and all that. I mean, it's like it's not like there's anything, you know, you know, with the exception of teenage boy misogyny, there isn't anything that's like. A shock. It's just like, oh wow. And like, there were a couple. There have been a couple really great lines about this. One is I can't remember. It was Matt Blaze, professor of cryptography, said that it's like um, he's in nerds. It's finding out he's in nerd skull and bones, because um, because CDC is like a big deal in the in the security and hacking community with good with good reason. And somebody else said it was like finding out that Bernie Sanders was in the Wu Tang Clan. I mean, it's. <laughs> So maybe just want to say a word about how you found that out. Did you have to convince him to uh, let you use his name? And what what happened behind the scenes when you when you were reporting that? Uh, sure. So um, when I started, when I committed to writing the book, because uh, there were a lot of things that that went into this, but I knew that the CDC had a former member who was in Congress, and I didn't know who it was. And the CDC members that were talking to me said. Um, that they doubted he would talk to me about it because the you know he'd never talked to anybody about it and um, they weren't going to tell me who it was and um, I said okay so but I committed to writing the book and so certainly high on my to do list is figuring you know can I figure out who the heck this guy is and then make a make a plea for him to talk to me um, and while I was sort of doing that I saw an article about somebody running for Senate in Texas which is where the CDC is from. And he he was the he, he had played in a punk band, and he'd run his own software company, um, and I'm like, come on, this has got to be him. And so um, I ran it by the CDC guys I'd been talking to, and they said we're not going to talk about who the congressman was. Um, uh, and this story about Better Rourke, uh, who had who was stepping down from his congressional seat, giving giving not running for that reelection, so he could try and go beat Ted Cruz. Um, he said we're not going to talk about it, uh, and I said, huh. Well, you know, the book's not going to come out until after November, right? Because um, all we were thinking about was this, they were thinking about was the Senate campaign, and they didn't want to hurt him during the Senate campaign. Um, and then I said, uh, yeah, so I, I, I hear by pledge I won't write about it until after the election is over. And they're like, okay. Yeah, it's better work. Um, <laughs> and we're proud as hell. Um, I'm like, wow, okay. So, um, so then uh, there was a fundraiser. One of them held a, um, a fundraiser for him. Um, and uh, I met him, and I said, look, I'm writing this book about CDC. It's about, you know, it, it's a positive book. I think it's kind of incredible that you were in it. Um, it's not going to appear until after November. And would you talk to me about it? And he said, yeah, sure, no problem. And um, he was incredibly nice. He, he, it was a terrific interview. Um, you can read it in the book and judge for yourself. But he was very candid about how, like, they were the cool kids, and he wanted to be like the cool kids, and how it was like Facebook back then and it was the way you connected with people and he couldn't find out about music from you know the mainstream magazines in, in El Paso which is where he lived um, and so it was a way to find out about obscure good music um, and you know why hackers are valuable is like outsiders and critical thinkers uh, which is something that I agree with well and a knowledge about technology in our society right now and how it's shifting and changing things and and uh, it's probably a good quality in a president to understand these dynamics um, in some ways, his his um, presence in CDC is not, uh, while while shocking and kind of amazing, uh, it's not that unusual to have members of these, or the, you know, some of the members go on to be in really prominent positions, and and in fact, this was one of the first groups to to actually testify in front of Congress from national security issues. Um, but before we sort of get there, back in the in the early days, um, describe the. Um, the, the conferences and how um, I made a film called uh, uh, We Are Legion, the story of the hacktivists. And in one part of that film, a lot of these people that were hackers and protesters online had had um, had come to uh, to protest the, the Church of Scientology. So, and these were physical protests that were happening in cities around the world, and they'd met each other for the first time. And one of the things I remembered them saying was, you know, you meet your meet your own people finally. These are people who. In, in the case of Anonymous and Chenology had sort of self-identified as kind of freaks, as outsiders, as kind of 
no good. <laughs> uh, and and w there was a, a moment that I actually found pretty moving when they all came together and met each other in person for the first time. And there was a real moment of kind of connection that, that, that existed there. It, when I read your book, I, I felt the same way about the early conferences. Um, and, and you make that point so well in the book. Talk, talk about HoHoCon and when this group of people that mostly communicated online finally met each other in real life. Right, so, so that, that is absolutely huge. Um, uh, so the aforementioned Jesse Dryden um, started a conference initially known as ExmasCon, um, and then you know got to the better name of HoHoCon, um, and it was in Texas. And it was imp particularly important for the folks in Texas to get together because they're all spread out. Texas had a lot of good hackers, but you know they're they're throughout this enormous state. Uh, whereas the New York hackers, Boston hackers, didn't have to work that hard to find each other. So it makes sense that an early important conference would be there. And HoHoCon gets to be called the, the first modern hacking conference, not because it was the first conference, but it was the first one to deliberately invite <laughs> the press and cops. Um, cops were, had been going undercover to other, uh, other conferences and occasionally arresting people, but um, they were openly invited uh, by Jesse to HoHoCon. And... Um, it was great because these people got to see each other, got to trust each other, got to learn what each other were working on. And um, one of the really important sort of pivots is that, um, uh, I hate that word, inflection points, was that um, members of the Boston hacking scene who are much more sophisticated technologically started coming to HoHoCon. Um, uh, uh, so people like, uh, who would later um, start and, and, and be big figures in the loft. Um, so. There are four people in the loft um, that were also in CDC, um, and uh, two of them are here tonight. Um, and um, um, that's a big deal, because that's when the CDC start, stops being the, they start becoming the thing that they were making fun of and they were jealous of before, like the elite hackers. because They were just like the cool guys making fun uh, and writing funny stories and whatever. And then through HoHoCon, they got to meet the guys who were, who were actually the brains of the outfit. Um, and they join, and so it's the loft that winds up testifying before Congress. It's the loft that have these like these serious prodigy types, um, and uh, you know had pioneered a lot of things, including like uh, coordinated disclosure um, of software flaws with the, the vendors. Um, to, yeah. But there was a there's this great dynamic this of of the loft basically being the good cop and CDC being the bad cop, but a lot of people didn't realize it was the same people. What would you, what's a basic definition of the loft, an offshoot? So the loft is, is the first known um, hacker space, uh, like a collective where they, you know, shared space at, to, f um, to fiddle with stuff, to experiment with computers, um, software. Um, they wound up uh, having a, a very early uh, LAN so they, they could play multi-person uh, video games. I forget which one it was. Um, uh, and they became, they became, really famous in 98 with the, the testimony before Congress um, when they testified that any one of the seven of them testified that any one of them could bring down the internet in half an hour. Um, and um, they were, you know, they were, um, they were very, uh, very highly regarded with good reason um, by, by other hacker types. Um, and, but they were like a little, they were a little cleaner. They wanted like consulting gigs and stuff they, they, and um, to advise the government. And so they couldn't do the sketchy performance art stuff that, and that's where CDC came in. There was, was like a symbiotic thing there. Yeah, the more serious security work, uh, maybe you might be, you know, done with, done at the loft, but if it was a little, little pushing the boundaries a little bit, or maybe a little more performative, or, so, or a little had a little more attitude, I guess, to it, it would be more CDC. Right. Uh, this but is a lot of crossover with the members and all that. This is actually really important. And remember, like, both groups are mostly operating under pseudonyms here. Nobody's using their actual name. Um, but there's still, like, double secret pseudonyms, um, you know, over in CDC. Um, but this is really important because, you know, the, the Loft guys in particular were finding flaws in software, and the software companies were just, like, wouldn't answer the phone, um, let alone, like, fix it. Um, and the Loft guys were, like, concerned about this. Like, you know, hey, you know, people... Uh, you know, we're not the only ones that can find these things. Other people are going to be breaking into your customers' machines. Don't you care? Um, and so they, they they moved them a little bit along. You know, it was hard work, but the loft like moved them um, along the, the right path. But um, some of these, most of these companies were either monopolies or all part of an oligopoly, and so they had very little incentive to change. And um, that's that's 
then there's this other turning point when Microsoft puts the internet into Windows. And like suddenly what had been like this niche business issue, like some database software has a flaw and you know, a few thousand people should know about it. It's like, oh my God, everybody's online and there's no security at all on Windows. It, it becomes an issue for everybody and CDC uh, is sort of perfectly positioned to try and, and call it out and, and make something happen. This seems like a really important part of the story. Um, I think a lot of people look at hackers and they say, well, what's the big, you know, why, why they don't get it. Why, why do they feel they need to go to extremes to release a, a tool or to, to be public about something or to even, even uh, hack and dump information? Why, why do they feel, the need, are these really white hat hackers? Um, you know, wh white hat as opposed to black hat hackers who uh, typically speaking are more thought of criminals. Uh, and what most, a lot of people sort of put themselves in this kind of gray hat area. Um, but I think, I think people, uh, a lot of people that aren't in the community wonder why, why go to these extremes? Why, why do this? Why, why make such a big spectacle? So of this, this is the fascinating, this is the fun part because a lot of these calls are, are close ones and there's disagreement within the group over what, what to do at various times. And there's disagreement about, um, what to do about, uh, Windows 95 coming with TCP IP and no security. Um, uh, but the problem was that bad guys had m already had multiple ways to get people to, to take over people's machines and it wasn't getting Microsoft to fix it. Um, so in this case, they decided that a good thing to do was not only to write a Trojan to allow remote takeovers of computers, but to make the biggest spectacle possible and try and get on TV um, because that would actually force Microsoft to ha answer questions about why it was that there was no security at all. So um, one, one of their number um, wrote a, a program called Back Orifice, which was a crude pun on Back Office, Microsoft software. Um, and um, instead of just releasing it, they like went to DEF CON, and DEF CON was the giant biggest hacking conference in the world, founded by Jeff Moss, who had been to HoHoCon and gotten the idea. Um, and decided to make it, you know, move to Vegas and make it big. Um, but the CDC were early stars, like frequently, like the best, you know, talks at DEF CON were by CDC folks, and they had panels there and stuff like that. So they used this sort of, um, this, the perfect sort of setting, and they went completely nuts. So they like, so Kevin Wheeler, the swamp rat, now grandmaster rat, thank you, um, put a cowboy hat, rabbit fur chaps, gold chains, and like, like a cartoon of what a bad guy hacker would be like. And, and like, um, and he led the, the crowd in this call and response, you know, I say dead, you say cow, you know, dead, cow, dead, cow. Um, and uh, they threw CDs with the Trojan on it into the crowd. Like now it, it go hack whatever you want. Here, here it is, take it, yeah. hack microphone, microphone. And, and, and sure, like, you know, respectable folks would be, what the frick are they doing? Um, but, it, but it worked, it got media attention, it embarrassed the hell out of Microsoft. And then what's funny is that um, Microsoft, like in public said it's not a problem, but if you're really concerned, you should upgrade to Windows NT or Windows 2000, which are you know, state of the art stuff, which was true, they were more secure, but it was also obnoxious because they were using their own flaws to upsell, right? Like, and so CDC, I mean, I would have given up long, I wouldn't even tried, but they were like, no, we're, we're actually, you know, <laughs> we see you and we'll raise you. And uh, so they, they had Chris Rue um, write a back over his 2000, which was much more sophisticated. It was open source, so any hacker could tweak it and get past any antivirus. It dramatically raised the stakes. There's more collateral damage, more people are gonna be hacked. But, you know, that's what really made Microsoft take security more seriously. Help people understand, just so, so they understand, why, why isn't a company like Microsoft and you know, the list is long on the number of companies that have been hacked. And, but wh why aren't they interested in making their own products safer? I mean, at that point, it's pretty clear. Microsoft is a monopoly. Um, that's one reason. It costs money to do this. Uh, so, so there's real, I mean, paint the picture for it. There's real economic incentives for them to be quiet about vulnerabilities in their systems. Yeah, no, this is, this is an enormous problem. So it's worst with Microsoft and other monopolies, you know, because they don't really have to do anything. There aren't alternatives. In m m many other kinds of software, there are like just a few dominant players. There's still that issue. Um, but 
the legal system, you know, the software lawyers uh, who are paid well had convinced judges that um, there is no product liability because you're licensing the program, you're not buying it. And so even if it's a lemon, you can't sue. So there's no legal way to do it. And, you know, Congress was, you know, to the extent they had any sort of technological clue 20 years ago, it was vastly reduced by the, the, the money that the software industry had and the fact that it was this economic golden goose. And, you know, and the, you know, you want to, you know, you know, if Bill Gates tells you like this incredible boom is going to end if you make us liable for our crappy software, then you know, or that they obviously Bill Gates wouldn't have put it that way. Um, they're not going to do it. They're just there's no why would you touch that? Why would you mess it up? And so the customers were the ones that got screwed. Um, and so that's what like this made the CDC resort to like extraordinary measures of public spectacle and so forth. And what's amazing is that even after sort of the spotlight moved on off CDC. They kept finding other ways to make this basically intractable problem better. The CDC there. Yeah, or yeah. the members thereof, yeah. Right. You know, one of the things I think is so interesting about your book is that you start to learn about these, these people, these individuals. It's, you know, it starts in the 80s, and, it, and you follow them through the 90s. And you, you learn about the kind of evolution of this, of this group. So, so not only are you you're learning or, or uh, exploring things like back orifice and other um, security issues, you're also learning about the group itself. And do, do you think that that period of time with the Microsoft gave them a sense of sort of a different sense of purpose or what they were all about? Um, yeah. Or is that too, is that too no, heady no, for no, like a I mean, hacker? It, you know, it's amazing. They, they killed the, they slayed the dragon, you know, and then there's kind of a, like a now what thing. And one of the real, the sort of the next big shift that comes because this, it, if, from this outsider to this group, this, this guy whose real name is, is Laird Brown, his handle is Oxblood Rough, and, and um, basically from outside the group, not knowing anybody in the group, he starts sending them emails and basically sort of flattering them and heckling them and cajoling them. And like, okay, yeah, so you, you know, you stomped on Microsoft, that was, that was amusing, but what do you really stand for? And they're like, who is this guy? And um, it, Laird had uh, worked in the like bowels, he's a Canadian, he'd worked in the bowels of the UN as a consultant, and um, he cared about human rights. Um, and he basically pushed them um, into this new direction of sort of a broader political direction. Um, and um, he picked the perfect foe, which is the government of China. Because one of the interesting things about CDC is that it's a fairly big tent. There are people who worked for the US government and there are people who hated the US government, but nobody liked the government of China, and in particular, its efforts to censor the internet. So he said, you know, you guys can do something. You've got all this talent, you've got the public stage. What are you going to do with that stage? You know, you've got a responsibility to help people, don't you? And so this developed into um, what one of the, the group uh, coined the term for was hacktivism, which they defined as, as security work in service of human rights, and human rights includes the right to information. Uh, according to a number of international treaties. So that's the direction they took in the early OOs, um, and it wound up having a, a, a really major and lasting impact. Yeah, talk a little bit more about that, because um, when I made the film We Are Legion, that one of the things that I, you know, it was about Anonymous, and Anonymous is, uh, uh, I guess, a modern example of potential use of this, sort of you know, hacktivism or hacktivism tool, use of um, you know networked systems technology to make some sort of a political point, whether that's defacing or or uh, denial of service attacks or just hacking and leaking of information. What are some of the you know? And when I made that film, is you know you, you you understood that the history of this and it started kind of in this time. What are some of the example other examples of what they what they've done with hacktivism or what or what the, those early days were like? So, so the you know the Oxblood wing of CDC, um, one of their first efforts was to create a privacy protecting browser, um, and uh, they 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 released one um, and it got a fair number of downloads, uh, and I think more importantly, it convinced well I know it convinced Tor to put it in a browser because in the olden days Tor didn't have a browser and maybe just what what is oh, Tor Tor sorry. Tor stands for the Onion Router, and it is is one of the major anonymity tools on the net. Uh, Snowden uh, in has endorsed it. Um, basically, what you do is you send a, a uh, you know you communicate to a, a Tor node, 
and then you know that Tor node knows that it has to send you to another Tor node, and they keep unpeeling the onion. They un unpeel a, le a layer so that nobody knows who the message is coming from and what's in it and where it's going. The, the first node only knows uh, where it came from. The last node sees the unencrypted message and where it's going, but that's it, doesn't know where it came from. Um, so it's super important. Um, anyway, uh, Roger but, Dingle. But the, goal, the goal is anonymity on the web to, to hide internet traffic and all right. of that. Which is super important in repressive regimes and there seem to be an ever-growing number of those. Um, uh, anyway, Roger Dinkeldine, the guy who is running Tor for many years, told me that it was because of CDC's browser that Tor decided that he decided that they needed to do a browser too. And that's actually how most people use Tor now. Um, it's not just for email, but it's surfing, surfing the web privately. Um, so that CDC can claim credit for that. Um, Another major thing they did is that they, they had, uh, Oxbot had long talks with the guys at the Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto who have done, continue to do amazing work tracking government's use of spyware against their own citizens uh, and um, really important uh, work and they sort of, they're academics and they're not beholden to anybody and so they get away with more than, you know, Google can't call them out, can't call out these regimes if they're working in these regimes or whatever. So. It was a very smart way to do it, so Oxblood also gets a fair amount of credit for that. Now, since then, lots of other people have said they're hacktivists and they do different things, like you enumerated, and I think there's good, healthy debate over whether those things are good or bad. One of the things that I get to in the book is that some of these things are actually nation-state stuff disguised as moral stuff, um, and that makes it complicated and, and interesting. Can you unpack that a little bit? So, so the notion of hacktivism, um, D disguising other nation state type activity. So I think one of the reasons that CDC was able to do things and not tear itself apart that Anonymous wasn't able to do is that CDC was placed a real premium on human relationships among each other. They, they met each other, they knew each other in person. Um, and, it wasn't, and it was small, it was maybe 20 active people at any given time. Um, Anonymous was huge and sprawling and anonymous, and they didn't know who each other were, uh, which is maybe you know a strategy to avoid everybody getting rounded up by the cops for a while. But it also is pretty dysfunctional and also guarantees you're gonna be infiltrated. So multiple nation states had people in anonymous, um, some probably in fairly high positions. Um, and uh, they there were also just good old fashioned criminals. So like while there was like protesty stuff happening against Sony, there were other people who were anonymous who were just going in and stealing all these credit cards from Sony. So, I mean, it gets, it, you know, it, it, it's got limitations. Um, so there were Russians in particular inside Anonymous. Uh, and then the more interesting thing recently, the more recently, the last few years, like when, if you've heard about anything about hacktivism the past few years, it's probably that there are these uh, folks that are breaking into these obnoxious spyware companies like Gamma Group and Hacking Team and stealing their stuff and dumping it on the web and also they're exposing that, oh, they've got relationships with the government of Ethiopia or this obnoxious government or whatever when they say they're not selling to people like that. Um, and the book, you know, the, the person that's claimed responsibility and definitely is responsible for some of it has, has claimed the name Phineas Fisher, which is a play on um, Finn Fisher, which is one of the company's um, pieces of spyware. But um, the story doesn't quite hold up because um, uh, Phineas Fisher also hacked um, in it, you know, like random people in Turkey like and dumped this like dumped these databases of, of people who with a vague connection to the ruling party and also hacked and doxed the uh, police department um, in um, in Catalan uh, in Spain um, ahead of a, a separate separatist movie a move and so none of that um, Anyway, you can read it for yourself, but I make the circumstantial case that it's a better bet that they're uh, Russians, again. Because m hacking team and Gamma Group mostly serve Western governments, and it's at the same time that the Russians have been hacking into NSA and dumping their tools. So I think it's an extension of, of that. Um, it's it's cyber, it's low-level warfare between the great powers, and sometimes they put on the mantle of a hacktivism. Um, if you haven't read this book yet, you should. <laughs> <laughs> it's, as you can tell, it starts uh, in a really interesting kind of way in Lubbock, Texas in, the, in 1984, 86. And uh, it just, 
it's a remarkable group because so many of the things that we're talking about and thinking about now, uh, tra you know, they were discussing back then. They were arguing about them back then. They, they, so much of those early discussions were are, are, are just the world we live in right now. Um, so I think that's, uh, it, and, and seeing it in your book laid out like this is really, really super compelling. So if, you're, if you feel like we're a little whiplash from the, <laughs> from the speed that we're going through this, I think it's, I think it's one of the real kind of beauties of the book to see, to see how this group has sort of dealt with this over the years and, it's, and the stakes have gotten higher and higher. So WikiLeaks would be a, a good example of that. Um, and, and Jake Applebaum. So. Yeah. So why? So you, right, right. So wh wh why don't you? Why don't you explain who? J Do people know who Jacob Applebaum is? Um, so let's 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 talk about Jacob Applebaum and Julian Assange and the sort of complicated relationship. Well, you all know who uh, Julian Assange is, right? Um, uh, so um, before he was Julian Assange, or after he was Julian Assange, you know, he, he was also known as Prof on IRC, and he was a fairly obnoxious hacker um, who didn't seem to be that much interested in the public good and was basically trying to bar badger people out of exploits. Um, and uh, he was from Australia. Um, but then he set up this thing called WikiLeaks. Uh, he and others set up this thing called WikiLeaks. And in the beginning, WikiLeaks uh, seemed to be doing some really good stuff. Um, you know, government documents from a variety of governments showing really questionable or bad things, including, you know, the, the horrific, um, you know, helicopter um, assault on uh, two of my uh, colleagues at Reuters, uh, her cameraman uh, in, in, um, in Iraq. And um, uh, that video is called Collateral Murder. Um, and it was a good thing that got out. Um, but um, Jake Applebaum was um, uh, one of the sort of the, the next generation CDC guys because you know people dropped out, they retired, they had to go out, get on with their lives, and CDC needed newer blood. And Jake Applebaum was this very charismatic young hacker uh, with a terrible backstory, a terrible uh, upbringing. Um, father was a, f father was a drug addict and died, and mother was a schizophrenic, and you know foster homes really tough um, and. Um, he he sort of burst on the scene and and did a lot of cool things um, and was speaking at DefCon, Black Hat, all these places. Um, it was attached to some really cool research and was seeming to come from a good place politically that CDC members are comfortable with. Um, and so they, so they brought him in. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I ha I got to see internal CDC emails because otherwise I wasn't going to be able to write this book because they're 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 tricksters. We haven't talked a lot about it, but they made they made stuff up, and so I couldn't have that happen to me. Um, and so I got to see these emails, and Jake didn't fit in from the beginning. Um, he was um, had a lot of arguments with the others. Uh, he thought there would be. I mean, the CDC was sort of tentative support for WikiLeaks in the beginning, um, knowing notwithstanding the fact that they all thought Assange was a jerk. Um, but Jake was at so, times took the position that there should be no secrets of any kind, and you know, even nuclear codes. Um, and one of the others in CDC, very quietly, was you know, a, uh, a DA, an assistant DA in New York State. And he's like, you know, as a prosecutor that deals with grand juries, I can tell you there's good reasons that some things stay secret. And um, Jake wasn't having any of it. Um, Jake is one of the last people standing around Assange after it becomes clear that you know, they're basically a tool of the Russian government. Um, yeah, he had also, you know, been a promoter and developer for Tor. Um, as it turns out, Jake is also personally a jerk um, and abused a number of women, um, and CDC kicked him out. And I think, like, one of the the real tests of your character is if you have a friend or an ally that is uh, accused credibly of doing something terrible, and do you stand by them, and how do you stand by them? And um, I think CDC gets a lot of credit um, for looking into it and not waiting for there to be a lawsuit or uh, police involvement, um, uh, but just like talking to people that they believed and publicly kicking him out, which is something they'd never done before. One of the things that I've uh, found in, in interviewing various people and making various films and contact that I've had with members of, of Cult of the Dead Cow, one of the things I've always found most compelling is the is um, is the discussion that's happening? It's often really, really passionate. It, you know, they're argue Sometimes it's flame wars, like argument, like really passionate arguments. Um, but you, but they're they're not. Um, you always get the sense that there's a there's a respect there. 
and you always get a sense that um, everybody is mostly trying to do the right thing, um, it, it wrestling with these very difficult issues of technology. Um, I, I find that really re refreshing. And I think you know one of the things your book does, and even when it's talking about Jake, is it gets you inside that discussion a little bit, and you start to kind of you and there's a lot of soul searching going on for a group that uh, started with such and has so much bluster at times. Um, they're really thinking deeply about these issues. Yeah, they are, and I think one of the reasons that they were so good at it is that they're coming from different backgrounds. They've got shared basic values. Nobody gets into CDC casually. I mean, some of these people have known each other for five years before they're invited to join. The one rule is that you can't ask to be to be a member, then they won't have you. Um, uh, but they they um, they came from different places. They're a diverse group. Like you know, Kevin Kevin Wheeler, the founder, was like a, is like a hype man, marketing whiz. Um, he's not a super tech guy, um, but they all sort of respected each other and, and heard each other out and had different viewpoints. And so the, that made them, their diversity definitely was strength. It was, it was definitely a strength. Um, and th like I said, on the, like the, sort of the, I think one of the interesting things is the government, not government thing. So um, Mudge and other of the sort of loft CDC crossovers after, after sort of the peak of CDC fame goes to work for DARPA and figures out a way to uh, give small grants to hackers um, instead of like a million dollars to IBM. It's like here's fifty thousand dollars to somebody in a garage who's got a really great idea. And I think that was uh, like another sort of inno innovative way um, to help society overall. Um, and um, you know, while others in CDC would not, like I said, would not have worked for the government. I mean, that was, I think that was a pretty cool move. M Mudge is another pretty central character in your book. What, t t tell us about Mudge. So um, Mudge is, <laughs> there's, there's a picture in the book of the loft, um, the loft testifying before Congress, and there's seven of them, and Mudge is in the middle. And they mostly look pretty normal, except that Mudge looks like a Megadeth guitarist. Um, and he deliberately did that. I mean, he really sort of enjoyed the hacker shtick. Um, and um, he was frighteningly bright. Um, it, from the Deep South, his dad um, uh, taught at University of Alabama, I believe. It was a university in Alabama, certainly, but did like uh, uh, NASA stuff. Um, and was a materials uh, professor. So, you know, Mudge, uh, you know, Mudge has a tendency to exaggerate, so you don't know how many of these stories are literal gospel, but, um, you know, he they trained him as a violin prodigy, but he was also like playing with like keyboards and computer chips and stuff like that from an extraordinarily early age. Um, and then he went to uh, Berkeley with two E's in Boston as a music uh, student, um, but immediately was hanging out with the MIT crowd um, and came into the loft and sort of became the front man of the loft. Um, and he was the one that um, dealt with uh, Richard Clark, the first, America's first cyber czar, uh, the first guy in the White House whose mission was to like work on cybersecurity. Um, and so he sort of brokered the, um, the testimony before Congress. And it's funny, like, if you see the picture in the book with, I think of it as the, the loft, the loft supper, is how I kept thinking of the, of, of the picture, because it, it looks like, you know, he's Jesus, and, you know, you have to wonder which one's gonna be Judas. Um, uh, as far as I know, none of them were. <laughs> um, but um, Mudge goes on to do DARPA stuff, um, which is phenomenal. Um, among the people he gave little grants to was Charlie Miller, who then went on to, like, hack the moving Jeep, um, a lot of like sort of the greats, and they had like well, I think it was like sort of this Council of Elrond meeting when he's going into DARPA. It's like okay, hackers finally have a seat at the table. What should I do? And that particular th uh, that particular one was Doug Song's idea, the the cyber fast track is what it was called. These little grants, um, but there's lots of other stuff he did that's classified. We don't know about it. It's around the time of Stuxnet. I know he did offensive stuff. Um, it's you know he was probably one way or another involved in stuff that the U.S. has done overseas which has saved a number of, of lives because, you know, there are complicated issues around uh, what you do with knowledge of software flaws, but, um, you know, it's probably better to use software flaws than to drop bombs on folks. And, you know, sometimes those are the two choices that our government is, is, is making. Well, that, that also sort of describes the, um, the, the complex relationship with law enforcement or with the intelligence agencies that's there right from the beginning. As you mentioned, HoHoCon was the first uh, hacker conference that actually openly invited the the authorities to come and said, "Come on, let's talk about this." And DefCon has been that way, of course. But um, S spot who isn't the Fed? Who isn't the Fed? <laughs> right, right. There's a game at DefCon. Like who 
spot the Fed. Uh, so that the, you win a prize, I guess. Actually, I did. I won that one time. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I was talking to somebody. Say, okay, fine. I'm the Fed. He opens his shirt and he says FBI. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, where was I going? Oh, did, talk a little bit about that complicated relationship. So, so this this goes back. I mean, remember, everybody starts out as a criminal um, if you're of a certain age. Um, and so that makes it that makes people nervous, um, and it is really tricky because the feds, especially back in the olden days when none of the feds knew anything about tech, um, and they sort of treated everybody as a criminal, and, and it, it was it was tough, and it was very hard to make that jump from having that criminal background, minor though it may seem in retrospect, into a straight security job. So that so some people did not make it. They tried to make that jump, and it was too early. Um, and they got outed as ex-hackers, and then nobody wanted to be seen doing business with them. There's less stigma now, um, but Mudge was really good at kind of walking the line. Like, yes, I'll go to intelligence agencies. Yes, I'll talk to the military, because if I ever get arrested, if the other people in the loft get arrested, it'd be really handy to have somebody with a lot of, like, you know, hardware on their uniform come testify and, and that I'm a good person and I help them. So, um, but another, the, another reason that he was willing to go to those guys and not the cops is that he doesn't want to name names. Like he's about sharing information, um, but uh, not ratting people out. And that that I think wound up being sort of the general line that that people who were okay with the U.S. government in some areas that's the line they would take. There are others that also did intelligence work, um, but still wouldn't rat out their their buddy, the longtime criminal. Uh, amazing. I feel like we've been going 90 miles an hour in a, st <laughs> a story that goes 35 years, um, and amazingly, we're getting kind of close. But I wanted to say what um, – give me a sense of – I mean, when I've, I've shown films, and I've many times had people come up to me and say, oh, you, you were members of CDC or the Loft, and they give me a, a business card or something that says Apple or something. And so <laughs> what uh, – give us a sense of where this group – has, where are they now? Right, so uh, awesome question. So um, I told you that, I mean, to me the incredible thing is like not only did they slay Microsoft the dragon, but after that they did all these things that made the world better uh, in different sectors. So Mudge in government, uh, Oxbud in assigns in, um, in sort of the nonprofit activist world, uh, and then in the private sector is probably the biggest impact of them all. So. The Loft um, turn, takes some venture money and turns into At Stake, this uh, security boutique that sends people inside the big companies, like ex-hackers, uh, inside Microsoft, inside big banks, and tells them what they're doing wrong. And uh, it's an eye-opening experience because the people working at those companies do not are generally from clean backgrounds and do not have you know real hard-won experience in the trenches. Um, and these hackers are freaking smart. Um, so that's a huge advance. Um, and then there's this like. Um, the other major private sector thing is that Chris Rue, the author of BO2K, founds Veracode um, with somebody else from the loft, Chris Weisopel. Um And Veracode, for the first time, allows big software buyers to look and see what the binaries in their code are actually doing, as opposed to what the source code thinks they should be doing, or worse, what some third-party audit thinks the source code thinks they should be doing. Um, and that's tilts the playing field towards the software buyers, which is desperately needed uh, because of the oligopolies and monopolies with no product liability law. Um, but the, probably the biggest lasting impact is the diaspora from at stake. So at, at stake fails to produce 100x returns to make the VCs happy, so it gets bought and smothered by Symantec. Um, but the people in there who um, then go on to do amazing things include Shortlist, uh, Katie Masuris, uh, who is like sort of like the the, the bug bounty goddess um, who got um, Microsoft uh, to pay its first bug bounties, which are payments to hackers who are helpfully pointing out flaws. She also got the Pentagon to pay uh, hackers who agreed under you know s certain specs to... Uh, this is a good thing, by the way. That it's <laughs> so all a very good thing. <laughs> you found a vulnerability, you found a bug, so uh, uh, you know, someone could break in. Don't, don't use it for your own benefit. Company, pay, company will give you some money, the Pentagon will give you some money. And then they can, they can yeah. Uh, way, ways for hackers to be helpful members of society. Very good thing. Um, uh, given the alternatives, uh, another um, at stake luminary is an old friend of CDC named Windows Snyder. Uh, Windows Snyder went in house at Microsoft and is the major force behind Windows XP Service Pack Two, which you, if you're completely geeky, uh, you know is was a major turning point in Microsoft security. Then she goes inside Apple 
and convinces them to treat the company itself as part of the threat to the, to the consumer, which is something that has not, had not happened anywhere. Um, but that was very you know, pre prescient because in many countries, um, possibly including this one, um, you know, the government will sometimes tell you to, you know, go make a raid on your user or, or your customer. Um, and because she had sort of set that way of thinking and the changing their uh, attack modeling, um, yeah, the a Apple was in a position to actually say no to the FBI um, when they did ask that sort of thing. Um, uh, and then the last, the last, you know, there are many great people from AppSec, but another one is Alex Stamos, who winds up being pretty important uh, because he's the guy at Facebook that blows the whistle on Russian election interference and disinformation. So he had gone to at stake because he had seen the testimony of the loft uh, and was like, wow, these guys are amazing. They just told Congress how bad the world actually is when like, you know, geeks already knew that, but you know, it wasn't making any difference. It wasn't getting through. So, um, so he's sort of trained with them and a lot, a lot of the smartest people and, and, and the ones leading kind of like the internal debates about moral stuff that the company should or should not be doing are either from CDC or were trained by people in CDC. So they haven't sold out by, this is a good thing. It is definitely a good thing. Um, you know, there are lots of different moral courses to take and lots of different things fit different people. And I'm not, the one size in no way fits all. Um, but it's important to think about these things. And I think that's what one of the things that's being lost. I do worry that younger people getting into security now may have gone to like a nice college and work for a nice big company and do cybery things, but they don't have that sort of, that the tough moral calls they're having to do all the time, like the old school guys did. And as a result, they can wind up being sleepwalked into doing stuff that in retrospect, they're gonna feel bad about. Um, like, you know, enabling surveillance or putting in a back door or, um, or working for unsavory government agencies. Um, and, and so I want them, one of my reasons in writing the book is I want them to think about and learn from these folks. They can pick which of these people they feel more akin to, but I want them to at least think about, uh, think about the moral issues. Because, I mean, coders are the unacknowledged legislators of the world right now. They have an immense power. Um, and um, they need to realize that, and I think others need to realize that, and try and make a make a moral pitch to them. I, I made a film about Aaron Swartz, and not to be a little slightly somber here, but when I when I read your account of the early days of um, uh, uh, and the antics of the of the of CDC and the others in that in the hacking community at that time, you know, there's it's clear that there's a little. Uh, pushing the boundaries and and a little transgression leads to innovation. You know there is a, there is a kind of original hacker mentality that let's break things and see if they go back together. Maybe we can put them back together a little bit better than they were before. We can figure out how they work. Um, and and to do that, you need to sort of uh, you know you need to push the boundaries a little bit. Um, is that still possible now? Is that is that is have we gotten a little too um, uh, has law enforcement gotten a little too aggressive with laws like the uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and others that that would prevent that kind of um, that kind of uh, playfulness that that is clear in the book and 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 I think it represents a lot of people in the hacker community that had actually led to real innovation. So that's interesting. Um, obviously, some people are abusing the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and and. Um, uh, if you haven't seen the Aaron Schwartz movie, I, I strongly recommend it. Um, and it, it's, it also is kind of depressing, but um, he was a able to accomplish a great deal, an uh, incredible amount in 26 years. Um, um, and is, is sort of a, like, a, he's, he's a, a real good hacktivist, uh, or was. Um, obviously, people are going to, uh, the cops given a law will at uh, times over apply it. Um, that, that is absolutely a, a, a big risk now. Um, I think in general though, I mean, there are more technologically competent feds than there were, certainly. Um, it doesn't mean that they're always gonna have the best judgment, but they can probably tell, you know, who's downloading stuff for fun and like who's a threat to national security. I, I think they can better now than they could before. Um, and I think, you know, I, th I, I know the intelligence agencies have waived a lot of stuff to hire talented hackers. Um, I, don't, I don't think the FBI is there yet. Um, you know, maybe they'll never be there. I don't know. In, ter in terms of uh, sort of pushing the boundaries in other ways, um, 
you know, there's cool performance arty sty type stuff, but it's true the industry has kind of grown up and matured and compartmentalized, um, and something something has been lost there. Um, but you know what I think is interesting, one of the most interesting things happening right now is the rank and file rebellion stuff in Silicon Valley. Uh, which, you know, I've covered Silicon Valley for 20 years and I've never seen anything like this. Um, not just Google, which has a tradition of employees speaking out and complaining about stuff, but um, Microsoft, which has no such tradition, and Amazon too, which has no such tradition. And they're mad about various things, um, selling facial recognition to the cops when it's biased. Um, uh, Google, among other things, are upset about uh, the anticipated possible return of censored uh, search uh, to the mainland. Um, there are a lot of issues, but they're 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 being very um, conscious about sort of like the theater aspects of it, uh, you know, in sort of classic union rabble rousing sort of ways. It's super fascinating to see like the elite of American professionals going in that direction. So, I mean, I think even if they're not all conscious about CDC, I think they are the heirs to that kind of thinking, more so, again, than their corporate corporate leaders are. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, your, your book goes back, it spans such an incredible period of time. Really, it really is amazing. Like, uh, you know, in, in, in the early, um, you know, you talk about some of the early, um, really idealism of the internet. And, uh, you know, you talk about John Perry Barlow and this, and the manifesto of freedom, you know, freedom of speech online. Um, and and now we find ourselves where a lot of people are really starting to realize that some of these companies are really, that can be dangerous. There's, there's a real dark side to there. I mean, it's not new, but it's now starting to reach a more mainstream audience. What, and for, and for and this group, uh, you know, a lot of what we're dealing with now, grappling with now, this this group, Cult of the Dead Cow, these were discussions they were having, right? right so, so, you, so in your very first question, you asked me about that first line in the book and about how technology is ruling the world and we are everywhere and it's changed. So, I mean, I think that that awareness has spread dramatically in the last three years. Um, these platforms are being used for evil, uh, murder, uh, authoritarian takeovers, uh, and the companies are not doing much about it. Um, and they can certainly do more. Uh, and I don't think there's like enough urgency to the discussion about this. Um, and, um, you know, it is hard to, you know, I, I think that's one of the things that's been lost. I mean, the most important thing about these guys, mostly guys, one woman, um, thank you, Beto O'Rourke, for bringing in Lady Carolyn, um, uh, is they're critical thinkers and they had a sense of um, moral purpose. And um, I think this country has a lack of critical thinking at the moment. Uh, and I sort of want to hold up a, a counter example. Uh, and the moral purpose stuff, again, you know, seems to have been, you know, lost a lot. So I really enjoyed talking to Barlow. I mean, I've known Barlow for years. Um, he's also gone, unfortunately. But, um, you know, he saw the CDC as a successor to the Merry Pranksters, you know, who were like tweaking the establishment, but had like a, an actual important, you know, message as well. Um, and, you know, we're having fun doing it. Um, and CDC were, were clearly, clearly like that, um, you know, playful, uh, but um, saying important stuff. And um, you know, I, I, it would be nice if more folks were thinking along those lines. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground in like <laughs> really quickly, um, but we uh, we're at the end. So we just want to open this up for questions. For yeah. Um, not only do I want to open it up for questions, but we have. Um, Waiting for it. Uh, we have uh, three members of the CDC here um, uh, on their own accord, which was awfully nice of them. Uh, so, if you have questions for, they're from different eras of the CDC too. So, if you have any questions for CDC members, in addition to me or Brian, um, let me know, and I will try and pick one of them to see if they'll answer it. Hi. Um. Hi. Should I stand up? Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Hi. Um, so my question is sort of related to um, to the last question that you just asked. Um, so I was wondering, um, you were talking about how the Pentagon kind of like pays off these hackers when they find the software flaws and about how they have this immense power. And so I was wondering um, if they do have so much power what would it take to get to the point where, let's say, hackers could actually s try to like push for, or, like force, like policy change? So, for example, the way that we have um, 
the way that we have a lot of like hate groups like proliferating on social media, for example, and then we don't have enough policy to res to uh, restrict that. Um, like how how would we get to how would hackers get to a point where they might actually be able to push for some kind of change on that front? Okay, so that, that's a really qu really good question. Um, so they in in many ways they are they're they're actually on all sides of that. So. Um, the hackers working for the Russian government that broke into the DNC accounts and leaked a bunch of documents were able to influence policy in a pretty serious way. Um, they certainly helped elect President Trump, if they're not the only reason for it. Uh, Alex Stamos I would consider himself a hacker. Uh, and one of his major issues um, that he dealt with at Facebook and before that at Yahoo was going to Congress and educating them on know, what's a terrible law, why the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act should be reformed, uh, lots and lots of stuff. And that's ha sort of how he got in into politics uh, or, you know, being sort of more aware of political action. So there are, there are hackers at all levels working for the government, working for big companies, and who are often doing, like, the most interesting work. Um, you know, one of the things that Aaron Schwartz did um, probably most famously, is Help Stop, SOPA, and PIPA, which were these really stupid, um, leaden copyright protection laws that would have, you know, stopped some basic functioning of the internet, um, including how, you know, search engines work, and would have shuttered a lot of websites as soon as anybody with a copyright claim, you know, complained. Um, so, Aaron was a hacker, um, and he... But it, one of the great things, again, about CDC is that they are more for like, okay, we don't know anything about the media, but we'll figure it out. We don't know anything about Congress, but we'll figure that out. Aaron Schwartz got very involved in, in sort of retail politics and getting activists involved, and in that case, over helping to overwhelm, getting Wikipedia to turn page black for a day, and getting all these people to, to write to Congress, uh, and he was able to stop that. So it, it is happening. Okay, thank you for your talk. By the way, I campaigned for Hillary Clinton and I campaigned for Barack Obama, just for the record. What about if, because now they're making investigations, what about if we find out that there were both sides, that some Russians wanted Hillary Clinton to win and they spy on the other side? And what about in now when the Democrats won, if the hackers helped them? I mean, it goes both sides. We cannot just point out one group, correct? Uh, and furthermore, we don't have proof by 100%. <laughs> uh, and, and, and furthermore, the U.S. has hacked, you know, the U.S. has certainly influenced, you know, meddled in elections around the world for decades. I mean, that's what intelligence agencies do, it's just different means. Um, so uh, I think one interesting thing is that a number of candidates have said that they will not. Um, site hacked records on the campaign trail. If somebody hacks and dumps, um, uh, you know, Beto O'Rourke's emails, uh, I think I think all of the Democrats perhaps have said that they would not use that against him in the primaries. Uh, for some reason, Donald Trump has not made that pledge, um, and I think that's interesting. Um, you know, it's not you know like I don't want want to just uh, pick on on him or even them. Uh, the media is also really screwed up here. I mean, the media. You know, people hand us stuff, you know, with a nation state motive, and we still write about it till the cows come home, and I think that sucks. I think there should be a sliding scale so that, like, I, I personally practice a sort of sliding scale. Like, for like the Sony, there we was talk about it internally with the Sony documents, the emails came out. Like, you know, look, this was an obnoxious thing. We don't want to encourage this kind of obnoxious thing. Therefore, something has to be really, really bad in those emails before we'd write about it. And we're not going to not look, but. You know, it has to be a higher standard. I think that I think that's doubly true when it's clearly a nation state. Um, you know, I don't want to I don't want to be their handmaiden, even if it's a legit news story. I don't want to be the one that writes it. It's worth noting in the context of your question that part of the Mueller report found out that that the Russians were involved in in, uh, in you know supporting competing groups with the intention of causing discord uh, and not not just one side. Thank you for your talk as well. Uh, I'm really curious about what you think about, uh, I have two questions. The first is the NSA tool that was dumped on the internet, 
that was then used to, you know, freeze the systems of the city of Baltimore and several others. That's my first question. Curious what you think about that. And then my second is, um, what are you excited about in this area for the next three to five years and what really like terrifies you? Um, so in the first part, um, the, 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 the NSA tool being wielded against Baltimore actually doesn't completely check out on the facts of that specific one. Apparently, there are two groups in there. There were the garden variety ransomware guys, um, and then um, somebody else was wielding, I think it was Eternal Blue, like one of the NSA tools. Um, there is a... Um, so I've actually written about this for years. There is, a, There was a process in the White House called the Vulnerabilities Equities Process. And when somebody, uh, one agency came up with a zero-day flaw that could be used, um, could be used to spy on another country, could use be, uh, used to attack another country, or could be used to like, you know, warn the software providers and get them to fix it. Um, there used to be that process. I feel it was tilted way too much towards offense. Um, and now that process is, I think, gone. Uh, so there isn't a process at all. So each agency is left to do what, it's want, what it wants. There's been, um, most of the agencies have more of an offensive mission, uh, except for DHS, which needs a lot of technical help from somebody else. One of the recommendations of the, uh, the Dick Clark Five post Snowden was that the defensive part of NSA, which turned out to be um, not completely credible, um, should be spun off. Uh, to maybe somewhere else in the Pentagon, maybe DHS, wherever, but to have some agency that's just about defense, like France has an agency like that. Um, and the NSA, the Congress did nothing, uh, and the NSA responded by hiding a IAD, like breaking it up and, and scattering all the pieces so it wouldn't be possible to do that, which is like exactly the wrong direction. So um, I am unhappy to get to your second question that um, I'm not gonna avoid the second part of that. That what's exciting that roughly 90% of what we spend on the cybers as a government is either is offensive if you consider surveillance to be part of offensive. Um, there's a, an American football saying, um, good, good offense wins games and good defense wins Super Bowls. Uh, we have the most to protect of any country and we're doing a crap job of it or we wouldn't have cities that get locked up by you know, garden variety ransomware thugs. Um, there should be Manhattan Project type efforts on defense um, and I'm scared of that not happening. As for her second part of the of her question, I mean, your your book is how the original hacking supergroup might just save the world. So she she asked you what ha what you're excited about. Is there is there some, yeah, is there some, it, it, you know, is there some? I, I mean, I think the, the the premise is here that some of these discussions have been had for a long time, and there's something we can learn about this moment from what's come before us. So I mean, I think the real saving. I mean, a lot of saving has been done. We don't know about it because it's hard to measure defense, which is another reason it doesn't get spent on enough. Um, certainly not well enough, um, uh, but the real saving is going to come in, in, in the inspiration of others who do great stuff like these guys have. I mean, they're still doing great stuff back there, um, you know, uh, in a variety of ways, uh, but there need to be other people to, we need new people coming on and saying, I'm going to try and do something awesome, um, like Aaron Schwartz, people like that, uh, and they will. Uh, my question is for both you and as well as the CDC members. Um, while I don't think that there are many as many hackers um, as there have been in the past, um, I do think that people are using different tools like doxing. Um, and I'd love to uh, hear about your opinions on doxing as a tool uh, for hacktivism or to share people's information, as well as uh, what implications you feel uh, we might see in the future regarding uh, people who are digital natives, you know, young people having more tools to do hack to do hacking of various sorts whether it's directly like what they used to do or things like doxing. Uh, um, so that's really interesting. The, on, on doxing, um, whew, I'm not, so it, there's a lot of, doc, that's a lot of like where the, like the, the action is right now, like um, Antifa and neo-Nazis doxing each other. Um, um, there, there is, there, there are some, there is a, well, I guess, you know, if he, he gave me a Hitler salute, I'm going to call him a Nazi. There's a guy in the book who, um, who I identify by name, um, who had initially been doxxed by Antifa folks. Um, I'm, I, generally speaking, I'm not a fan. Um, you know, anonymous, I'm equal opportunity, right? So I've written nasty stuff about China, Russia, the U.S., and anonymous, and anonymous attempted to dox me, and they 
they, except they said I worked for Rupert Murdoch, and I was at the Financial Times, and Murdoch doesn't own all the financial press, so that was wrong. Um, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a fan of the, the, the hardcore personalization of these attacks, and I think doxing is a weapon for it, but I think other people can, can disagree. Um, in terms of the di digital native stuff, I think that's interesting. Um, you know, the meme warfare thing, I mean, I mean, it's still bizarre to me that elections can decided by who's the catchiest memes, but I guess I guess that's true, and, and, and hackers are doing that. I mean, at least they're fighting with propaganda and speech as opposed to, you know, destruction and stuff, uh, which is scarier. Um, I see a CDC member. Uh, please rise and be recognized uh, by the chair, Adam. <laughs> this, th th this is the guy that held the fundraiser for Beto O'Rourke that I attended and where I met Beto O'Rourke. Uh, we're pretty much pro-doxic Nazis. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you have it. A little bit about doxing is like, you know, if it's a powerful person abusing their power, that's a different sort of thing. Than, uh, yeah, I, they, I mean, yeah. especially the people of the alt-right, they live in the shadows and they like to be fucking edgelords behind a name. And as soon as you show them for who they actually are to their parents, to their coworkers, it shames them in the ways that they, it takes the power away. And, you know, the alt-right has been allowed to to, to grow and fester because they did it in the shadows and take away their fucking shadows. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, and then also in 1944, there was a bunch of American anti-fascists stormed the beaches of Normandy. We're supposed to be anti-fascist. We're Americans. Yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> How many people have Antifa killed? <laughs> Corey's been raising his hand. <laughs> Diana, here's a question. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask about defense. I just heard Alex Stamos give a talk at UC Berkeley about defense, and, and he was talking about it in the context of the decentralization movement, you know, this, this like we want to restore the internet to something that isn't just five giant websites filled with screenshots from the other four. And he said, you know, if, if you're going to, like, let third parties connect to Facebook in ways that Facebook doesn't like, we're not going to be able to find harassers and bad actors and uh, you know the next um, Cambridge Analytica, and the question I think comes down to like if you believe them, do we want to save the internet or do we want to make big tech better? Uh, and I first of all, do you believe them? And second of all, which would you choose, fixing big tech or fixing the internet? That's really interesting. I'd not heard that before. So he's saying that if you make Facebook less. Uh, gives it fewer godlike powers, they won't be able to spot the bad guys as easily? Well, I, so I'll tell you something, one thing that I've been, been looking at is the, is the move to encryption. I don't know if he, was, he did he get into this, like the, so, okay. So end-to-end -end encrypting everything, which is what Facebook is, is in the process of doing, um, is a very interesting thing um, because, you know, on the surface, privacy people should be happy. Um, and I in particular, you know, if you're worried about citizens in other countries where, you know, the feds can just knock on the door and demand everything about it, that's a real thing. On the other hand, you do seem to be, if you're talking about like Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups and things like that, you're basically giving up and turning it over to mob rule. And the biggest mobs are the ones that work for giant corporations and governments, and their job is to push out disinformation. Um, I personally have a really big problem with that. Um, uh, fortunately, I don't have to decide any of this stuff. I'm curious what I any of our CDC folks care to uh, weigh in on what they think about the sort of, like the trade-offs involving like greater encryption, but also like less visibility into organized disinformation? Yeah. Um, Chris Rue, ladies Chris and gentlemen. Chris Rue. Hi. Um, yeah, my take on this is that uh, large groups like Facebook that basically have a sort of big arms around the entire population um, are doing a huge disservice by making every psychopath your next door neighbor. You know, um, we have lost the sort of clustering of neighborhoods. You know, you always knew who your neighbor was 50 years ago. Nowadays, your neighbors are literally the entire world. 
the information that you get and how fast it propagates doesn't get filtered through, uh, you know, a person-to-person -person BS detector anymore. It just goes from one person making stuff up directly to you, and you, there's no there's no opportunity for the masses to sort of make up their mind about whether something's true or not. Um, we've lost some collective immunity as a result. Um, so in terms of privacy, I think we've given up a lot of privacy, um, and it's not necessarily worth it. The, the amplification of garbage out there um, is exponential, not linear. So, you know, you've got these groups that are, you know, finding each other on these mediums, but if you were to make the argument that Facebook is a tool for good because they can do monitoring, you're ignoring the fact that decentralization uh, for the purposes of protecting the miscreant identity um, is happening regardless of Facebook. You know, there's other more neutral, connected social media like Mastodon and other, you know, the alt-right set up their own Twitter called Gab AI. You know, they, these things will happen to pull them back into the darkness so that they can operate without being monitored by the Facebooks of the world. Facebook can't force you to use Facebook. You know, if you're gonna talk about something that, that you know, you don't want Facebook staff to read, you do it somewhere else. And then you return to Facebook to piss in the pool. You know, once you've figured out what you're going to say and what memes you need to craft and that kind of thing and how to target the people that are sitting ducks in this giant pool that you can reach immediately. You know, you break up Facebook, you make it harder to reach people, and really there's no, no, no nothing of value is lost. You know, that's my perspective on it. I guess in some variation of your question, this m more simple thing where, where Facebook is basically asking for the federal government to step in and say, well, where are the speech lines here? You know, should we hate speech online on our networks? Isn't, aren't they basically saying, I mean, this is a way of just going like this, right? Okay, you, you tell us what's right or what's wrong, uh, to be on our, on our speech line. And isn't that a variation of, are we gonna break the internet or are we gonna break, are, are we gonna, are we gonna break our basic speech laws? some 45 years ago, and we don't we haven't had anything like it since. I, I think I don't think it breaks the internet to break up those big companies. So no, no, but I do think no, I agree. Uh, but I think that what they're saying is, if you want to keep, if you want us to fix the internet, then you can't break us up because only companies as big as us no, can sorry. fix the internet. No, sorry. Yeah. Well, sure. Please don't throw me in that briar patch. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting interview. Uh, you discussed basically the human aspect of internet and interconnectedness and how we have good actors and bad actors involved in this, whether it's a government or an individual. My, co my concern is with the advance of technology and artificial intelligence and deep machine learning. Is somebody looking or analyzing the moral implications of what could happen. Are we losing our privacy? Are we heading into 1984? Uh, so uh, that was another motivator for me in writing this book, uh, is that uh, I think AI is terrifying, and I think um, uh, it's, 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 it's this ultimate cop-out uh, where you could say, well, the, the algorithm did it, I didn't do it. Um, but if that algorithm is trained, particularly on machine learning, if it's trained on a certain subset of data, one of my colleagues wrote a story about Amazon, and you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost comical. It was like a Amazon's AI was uh, selecting job candidates, and um, basically they were like throwing out all the women <laughs> because like it was modeling it on like who's been a successful candidate in, in the past, and it's all white guys that work at, at Amazon. So like, you know, if your name is Biff, you're going right to the top of the heap, uh, but the computer said it, so it's not our fault. This is terrible. I mean, the, the sort of discrimi mass discrimination that this can enable, um, I mean, there, there's countless examples. The good news is there, there are all kinds of nonprofits, not all of which are you know, secretly bankrolled by the big companies, um, that are working on this stuff. There's all kinds of academics, there's really good work, but there's, a, there's an urgency to ethical stuff. The EU is trying to come up with something 
um, some transparency rules and some other things. Um, but because the machines are getting so powerful, like it, I think I conclude the book with this, like like the, the 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 need for the ethics, human ethics, getting involved has never been stronger than it is now. Hi, thanks for a really interesting discussion. Seems to me you may have swerved away from something that has some importance. I'd like to, when you mentioned Julian Assange, okay, let's let's say he's an unsavory character, but isn't the real issue here that that's an organization? that was able to penetrate into some really dark secrets of the government that the public should know about. But now, because of this unsavory behavior, allegedly, it rises to a level that he can be prosecuted in such a way that gives tremendous power to the government to block whatever hackers may exist who could penetrate and tell us interesting things. And uh, so I think that's a very important thing well, the, the hacking that you're talking about doesn't really it doesn't really break into that area very much All right, so as i said in the in the in the book i do go into this sort of nation state stuff in the guise of hacktivism and i do talk about the hacking of these spyware companies so there there is some of that so assange um i did not say that i you know i think he's a, a jerk and i think he was working for the russian government um, I did not say that I think he should be prosecuted under espionage laws. I think that's really alarming because, you know, he, he almost entirely he was working as a publisher. Uh, and in, at least in this country, you get to publish stuff. And it is really scary that one of the, uh, the charges against him is just cites the publication of this stuff. That is a really scary line. I don't like that line. But there are other people who can publish and there are other people that can hack. And uh, the world will will go on without without him in charge of of, of WikiLeaks. There there have been a lot of scary cases of over prosecution, including Mr. Schwartz. You know, I th so unfortunately it's it's nine o'clock, and um, uh, I think that's it. Uh, so there's there's books back there. I'm Thank happy you, to everybody. sign if you, if you like over here. And it's a great journey through technology. It's Thank great. you very much. Yeah.